Let's just go straight to this. Um, how did you come about the name Patrice Lumumba? Does he have anything to <laughs> First do? First of all, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, ordinarily referred to as PLO Lumumba, which is Patrick Lodge Otieno Lumumba. Okay. But you will remember that this immediately after the independence struggle in the early days in the 1960s, 61, 62, parents who were politically aware would name their children in memory of some of the freedom fighters. And I think Patrice Semery Lumumba distinguished himself very early on. You'll find people named Kwame Nukuruma, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, and we see it even today with Nelson Holisasa Mandela. So that is in the, the context in which my parents thought that Patrice Emery Lumumba deserved to be immortalized in my person. Great. What do you think African people can do to fight against corrupt leadership? I think Africans must recognize that bad governance is harmful to their very well-being, not only for the current generation, but generations yet to be born. This is a continent that has always had potential. These are a people that have, have, have always had potential. But since we regained our independence from the colonialists, African leaders in many countries have consistently demonstrated that they are not working in the interest of their people. And that is sad because many of the individuals who occupied positions of leadership are still beholden to the colonial masters. We see former French uh, colonized nations, leaders who are beholden to Paris, those who are colonized by Portugal, beholden to Lisbon, those who are colonized by Belgium, beholden to Brussels, those colonized by the United Kingdom, beholden to London, and the single country that was colonized by Spain, uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, beholden uh, to Madrid. And this is tragic. Of course, currently, many African leaders are getting beholden to Beijing and progressively the United States of America in Washington. The net effect is that the African agenda is being sacrificed to the detriment of the peoples. And we have examples which are live as I speak. The problems in the Cameroon the problems in Togo, the problems in South Sudan, the problem in Central African Republic, in Mali, in Mauritania. And these are sad things. And the tragic thing is that the African Union appears to be helpless in this situation. Africa has been victimized by systems of government which we do not understand and which are not serving as well. And the time is now to wake up and to begin to find African solutions to African problems. Is it doable? Yes, it is. But we must wake up from our slumber because those who are in positions of leadership are quite comfortable with the situation as it is. We must some have something in the nature of an Arab Spring. The Arab streets woke up. And they told their leaders, you are going to do that which is in our best interest. Unfortunately, some of the gains made after the Arab Spring have been clawed back. And that is a lesson for us, that if you regain your independence, you must remain eternally vigilant, because, it's, because the forces of reaction are very persistent. So, Prof, you mentioned the African Union I mean, has the African Union become a toothless bulldog? I mean, in terms of, I mean, getting rid of corrupt and sit tight leaders like the Zimbabwean leader, uh, Mugabe. And <laughs> you know what, what is amazing become? about the African Union, which is the immediate success of the OAU, is that it's beginning to let Africa down. I, I was amazed about a month ago when Zimbabwean president, whom I respected, in his early days as a freedom fighter and as a man of vision and intellect, when he went to the African Union and made a donation of one million dollars, <laughs> and the African Union accepted it, in a situation where the people in Zimbabwe are suffering, 
where there is almost 80 to 90 percent unemployment. And the reason why the African Union has become, as you rightly say, a toothless bulldog is because there are no leaders who are true crusaders for the agenda of the African Union in the manner that we had in the early days when we had Nkuruma, when we had Nyerere, when we had Hail Selassie, when we had Gamal Abdel Nasser. Today, in a very perverted concept of non-interference in the affairs of other nations and in a perverted understanding of the idea of sovereignty, people are not their brothers and sisters keepers so that we know that there is a festering wound in South Sudan and we are doing nothing about it. We know there is a festering wound in the Cameroons and we are doing nothing about it. A festering wound in Togo and we are doing nothing about it. And even when the leaders congregate in Addis Ababa for their annual jamboree, they don't discuss these problems. Right now, I would have thought that there should be an extraordinary session of the African Union to discuss a number of things, to discuss the countries which are in trouble, and I'm mentioning them ad nauseum, to ask the question, what is the problem in the Central African Republic? How can it be resolved? How, what is the problem in, uh, in, uh, the Togo, in Togo, in Gambia, in the Cameroons, and in many other countries, so that we have African solutions to African problems? Because what we'll see very shortly is that the UN will sit down and send a peacekeeping force. And when there is no peace to be kept, and they send peacekeeping forces when, in a manner of speaking, the horse will have bolted away. So the African Union is very disappointing. When Dr. Mohammed was appointed as the chairman of the commission, I thought that this was a new person that would come with new energy to replace Nkosan and Lamini Zuma. But what I see is lethargy. What I see is lack of enthusiasm. What I see is lack of direction. What I see is continued pain. I was amazed about a month ago, if I'm not wrong, when the international community asked the African Union to nominate a country to sit in the Security Council, and they nominated the Democratic Republic of Congo. How can you possibly nominate the Democratic Republic of Congo, whose president has refused to hold election, whose country is generating refugees, whose government is controlling Kinshasa only in real terms, and where there is conflict everywhere, and where the resources are being taken away by the Chinese, the Malaysians, and the Belgians, and other rogue individuals from Europe and America, and you nominate such a person? You nominate Aina to sit in an assembly which is judging how goats should be preserved? It is a tragedy of gigantic proportion. And we consistently do this in Africa and we think is normal. Africa has now normalized the absurd and we think that sense is what we do. Yet it is nonsense. And unfortunately, many of us who are not in positions of influence, our younger generation particularly, think that this does not matter. This matters. If you look at the history of revolutions, it was always the young people. As early as 1980, uh, 1908 in Turkey, it is the young people who came up to rise up against the dictatorial regime. We remember even during the Bolshevik Revolution, it was the young people. We remember during the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy, among others, it was young people. In 1968 in France, when there was a problem, initially in 1958 and 1968, it was young people. We remember in Tiananmen Square, it was young people. We remember in Korea in 1980, it was the young people. In South Africa, in the Sharpeville massacre in 1969, it was the young people. In Soweto in 1976, it was the young people. In the Arab world, it's the young people. But our young people in Africa today are imprisoned by Arsenal and Manchester United and Barcelona and Real Madrid. And our young girls are imprisoned by cheap South American soap operas and Beyonce Knowles. 
How can that be? How can a continent be so accursed that our young people have no sense of her history, no sense of her presence, no sense of her future? No wonder the Chinese are conquering us by the day. And we are wondering. John F. Kennedy said in 1960, a society whose young men and women are in a constant state of slumber will never realize our potential. Our young people must wake up. It is only the day that they wake up that they will be able to send a clear message to those in positions of leadership that you cannot continue to misgovern us. I look forward to those days. Let's get back to African leaders. You appear to uh, believe in the president of Tanzania. Uh, that's uh, John Magufuli. Um, our own president, President Mohamed Buhari of Nigeria, has been considered, uh, has been, he's been perceived as a clean leader. But you don't seem to be fond of him. Why is that? I have mentioned President Mahmoud Buhari fondly in a number of forums, but remember that uh, President Mahmoud Buhari came into office and has been unwell. And therefore, he is not performing at full throttle because of sickness. And you must remember that when the captain is unwell, even if there is another captain who replaces him, the ship it does not move with the steadiness that it deserves. Remember that the president of Niger the, the United Republic of the Federal Republic of Nigeria inherited a system that was rotten to the core. Rotten because of corruption. In fact, he campaigned and won the elections on the promise that he would fight misgovernance and corruption. And I have no doubt in my mind that those who are corrupt, when he is away and unwell in the United Kingdom, they celebrate, say, this is our turn. They fight back so that there is a sense in which he needs support. And it's not lost on me that his vice president, Osin Banjo, has tried to support. But when you are in an acting capacity, there is a limit beyond which you cannot go, lest your president think that you are beginning to undermine him. I wish your president Godspeed in recovery and also that he institutionalizes and ensures that his agenda is bought by the others. There must be a buy-in. If you look at uh, the whole concept of religion, even if you want to give it a spiritual dimension, in the Christian religion, Christ had a message from heaven, but he sold it to 12 others. And there was a buy-in, and that buy-in is what has seen Christianity spread over a period of 2,000 years. The Prophet Muhammad had an agenda. He said he went to the mountains and he was told, Ikra, read, and he read and came back with the agenda, and he sold it. He tried to sell it in Mecca. It didn't sell very well. He went to Medina, sold it to his Sahabas, and ultimately Islam spread. In other words, what I'm trying to say that throughout the ages, no matter how good your idea is, that idea must be sold to others, they must buy into it, and that is how you institutionalize the idea. You cannot be a lone warrior in this matter, because the children of darkness hunt like a pack of wolves, and they will devour you if you are alone. That's serious. Um this is quite unfortunate. Uh, the last, that was the, the, the members of the National Assembly of Nigeria actually asked you, I mean, you gave a lecture and, uh, on corruption and um, you gave some advice. And uh, uh, just like you said now, corruption seems to be fighting back and Buhari doesn't seem to be getting the kind of support. And despite the lecture you gave, why has it not impacted at this leadership of the National Assembly? I think if you are looking for instant coffee solutions, you will be disappointed. In the fight against corruption, it has been demonstrated throughout the world that un unless you sustain the war, and it is a war, yeah. remember that there are individuals, not only in Nigeria, but throughout the world, yeah. who suckle from the breasts of corruption. And they are not just about to win themselves off. 
the suckling. They must be forced out of it and they'll fight, fight back because they're individuals, even in government, in all sectors of government, who now take their children to school on the basis of money corruptly acquired. They live in houses that are corruptly acquired. They do everything on the basis of things that are acquired through corruption. So when you want to stop it, they're going to kill you. They are going to ensure that you are neutralized. These are the people that you are fighting against because these are individuals whose conscience is dead and they are going to do anything on earth to prevent you. In fact, when one chooses to fight corruption, one must remember that he or she can be eliminated at all times. And what President Buhari and indeed any other president in the world must do is to recruit the population. If the population has been wedded to the idea that corruption is a bad thing, then that is the beginning of the success of that battle. When I see, for example, your former Minister for Petroleum being uh, investigated in the United Kingdom without being a sadist, I'm very happy. Because if you look at the wealth that he is alleged to have accumulated, that is unexplained wealth. Even if he lived for a thousand, she lived for a thousand years, she would never make that kind of money. James Seabury, who was prosecuted, convicted, and served sentence in the United Kingdom. What lacks in Africa is punishment. Impunity is alive and well in Africa. And we, the electorate, as I say, times without number, are in the business of celebrating thieves. We must stop. Yesterday, uh, Barista Farana said it very well, that we camouflage theft by giving them nice English names, money laundering, fraud, embezzlement, and all those veneers that make them look as if it is some kind of nice game. Let us call these men and women by the right name. They are thieves, stealing on an industrial scale. They are murderers. And once we begin to call them like that, and they have a mark of cane upon their forehead, and we shun them, has it been done in African countries? Yes, it has been done. And I keep on repeating in countries such as Tanzania, they are being dealt with. In Rwanda, they are being dealt with. In Mauritius, they are being dealt with. In Botswana, they are being dealt with. Once you begin to deal with them, then the others who may want to behave like them will begin to take the cue. We must, in the nature of things, earn what we earn through the sweat of our brow. That is the only way in which Africa will realize their potential. Many of these individuals who are in positions of leadership in Africa don't want to leave because they are thieves and they are scared. They are scared that if they left office, they would be prosecuted. And my view is that they should be prosecuted. You know, individuals such as Hissen Habre, who we know what he did, was it in Chad? A good example to the leadership that impunity will not thrive because I've been talking to a friend of mine from the Cameroons who tells me what is happening in their country right now and other African countries are blind to it it doesn't even occupy the headlines of the neighboring newspapers of the, the country's neighbor uh, neighbors uh, newspapers yet the Cameroons now should be in the same position as we see the conflict in Catalan in Spain Yet we are attacking it in page 13 in newspapers in Nigeria, in Liberia, and other countries. The time has come that Africa must learn and realize that the world is not bothered about Africa. The world is only bothered about Africa when they want to take the resources of Africa. Then they bother. They want oil, they bother. And I'm using the word bother in a very deliberate fashion, not in the traditional orthodox fashion. They bother when they want to take our timber. They bother when they want to take our bauxite, when they want to take our coke, when they want to take our uranium. But they don't bother about us. They, are, they come to our continent without disrespecting the elephant, and they want to preserve the elephant so that they can come and watch the elephant. But they don't care if a hundred uh, Africans die. They want to preserve our monkeys. They want to preserve our leopards and our other animals, but they don't care about us. To them, Africa is a zoo of sorts. 
And until the day that we Africans realize that we are on our own, we are going nowhere. And very soon they are going to shut us out if they have not shut us out already. We will not go to the United States of America, we will not go to Europe, and I'm happy that we are being forced to stay in Africa. Let us stay in Africa and build Africa. I mean, what does Africa lack in terms of resources? What, what do we lack? If it is solar energy, which continent is capable of producing solar energy to light this continent and the entire Earth? If it is hydroelectricity, what can we not generate? If it is minerals, if we wanted to make bombs, if we should, where do they get their uranium from? If it is timber, what don't we have? If it is human resources, we are two billion of us. And we are people who have intelligence. And yet we are kept in a constant state of conflict. The Europeans, the French persuading their former colonies that they are more French than they are Yoruba. They are more French than they are Wolofs and Mandinkas. The British persuading us that we are more British than we are Ibibi or Yoruba. And of course, when we find ourselves in that schizophrenic state, then we engage in internal conflict and they sell their arms to us. Tell me, which African country makes guns? None. That's, that's really, it's really revealing. Um, Prof, in the context of this analysis, would you agree that corruption should be treated as a crime against humanity? Without doubt. I've always said, and, and I think that this, sometimes you've got to raise things to the level of the absurd. Because what does corruption do to, to a country? Look, look at the, the thieving ways of Mobutu Sese Seko in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo has never recovered from the thieving of Mobutu and his acolytes. How many people did not have medicine in hospitals, including a hospital named after his own mother, Mama Yemo in Kinshasa? How many died? Perhaps more than in the Holocaust. How many people have died in the Cameroons in the 30 years that Paul Beer has been the president through corruption and all that money is tucked away in Paris in France? How many people die in our roads because of portals? Because some government official took away money that ought to have been used to make good roads. So this is a crime against humanity for which punishment should be the ultimate punishment. And in China, they do exactly that. They come to this part of the world, they corrupt our leaders. But if you are corrupt in China, they'll deal with you firmly, swiftly, and take away your life so that you are no longer a danger to society. I believe that corruption should be a crime against humanity. Because the, the impact of corruption in Africa in many areas, how many people are maimed because we imported polio vaccination that were not potent so that somebody could buy a mansion in Florida or some other island in the United States of America or in the Caribbean? How many? How many of the roads here in Nigeria, how many have been involved in defense contract corruption so that we have in a situation where we cannot have things that we ought to deserve? I mean, it has been more pernicious than any other thing. Corruption has killed more people than the civil wars combined in Africa. And yet we treat it with velvet gloves. We glamorize these individuals. We continue to elect them in office. They bribe us with 500 naira, 500 cities, 20 kwanza, and we continue to elect them. And then they claim democracy. Look recently during the UN General Assembly in New York, New York, what and how African leaders behave. They stayed in the most expensive hotels. The world of Astoria except the Tanzanian delegation. And yet, in their homes, people don't have portable water to drink. Yet, in their homes, there is no medicine in hospitals. You know, sometimes in, a, in an interview setting such as this, we 
appear to be intellectualizing about it, to be philosophizing about it. But if we walked out two kilometers away from here, here within Lagos, they are real things. There could be testimony of a woman who delivered on the roadside because there was no health facility. There are real issues in Africa, very real. Perhaps sometimes we should take these interviews there so that they are testimonies. Great. Um, you've given passionate speeches about corruption across the African continent. Has there been reprisal from corrupt African leaders targeted at you? <laughs> I'm, of course, there, there are times when I have, have made speeches and I'm told, were well, you a national of this country, would have arrested you immediately. But luckily so far, uh, they have not arrested me. But I've irritated many. And I have no doubt in my mind that I have no shortage of enemies, particularly in officialdom. And I know, particularly in my country, I have no shortage of enemies within and without government. But this is the path that I have chosen. When you, I could sit in my home and, and simply earn my salary or whatever I earn from whatever activities I'm engaged in and, and drive big cars, but there is a spirit that tells me that that is not good. There is a spirit that tells me that there is a message to be sent out there. And perhaps that is the contribution that we can make to prick people's conscience, to keep talking about this. And when you do this, you have no shortage of enemies, but there is also a group of men and women who appreciate what you are doing and they embrace it and they do it even better by engaging in practical activities. And this is what energizes us. And I pray and hope that this will continue. And I know there are many other people in Africa who are doing better things than I am. They may not enjoy the visibility that I'm beginning to enjoy in Africa, but they are doing great things in their little corners of the world. And I believe and pray and hope that the messages that we continue to give energizes them in some way. In a manner of speaking, this is a crusade. That's right. uh, let me take you back home. I mean, does it bother you that people are beginning to, I mean, think differently about you because of your support for President Uhuru Kenyatta, who has been adjudged to be correct by some? Which, which, I find that very stupid, actually. Uh, I've, uh, I'm non-aligned and positively neutral, and anybody say, and, and those who are saying that is because as a lawyer, I was instructed to appear for the Independent Electoral Commission. What is the role of a lawyer? The law, role of a lawyer is to urge a client's case. And those who think like that are simply people who are, let me say, stupid. Anybody who, who thinks that a lawyer representing a body is supporting anybody is, does not know what the role of a lawyer is. It's like saying that a doctor who is treating a patient with HIV AIDS now supports AIDS. That is how absurd it is. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is once my conscience is free, and, and, and I think uh, uh, Winston Churchill said it very well, that if you turn to throw stones at every dog that barks at you, you'll never reach your destination. I'm not just about to turn and throw stones at every dog that barks. And this assumption in Africa that somebody has an opinion and therefore he wants you to follow that opinion is misguided. I have my own views about things and I have a professional duty to serve. And that is what I'll continue to do because I believe I'm right. And history, by God's grace, in the last 20 years that I've taken positions, have been vindicated. The position that I've taken by direct, by some divine direction. After a short time, I'm vindicated. Yeah, let, let me ask this. What's the implication of the Supreme Court ruling against the elections in Kenya, as far as uh, judicial precedence is concerned? I think, Africa, number one, I think that the majority judges got it wrong, knows that they were wrong. Why? 
when you are uh, looking at an election and the expression of the will of the people, you ask yourself, where does the will of the people reside? It is in the vote. And if you doubt the vote, you count the votes. You don't ask whether the transmission of the results failed through an electronic process when you have been presented with the actual documents. This is the, without precedent in the world. And if you look at the minority ruling in that case, in a few years, the minority ruling, which even if you listened, was the more legally potent. So these, these judges who are in the majority were completely wrong. And they know it, I think, that they got the law wrong, they got the facts wrong, and is now even emerging that their decision was based on fake forms, which must have been infiltrated by the petitioners. It is tragic. And this is one of the problems in Africa, and, and I see many people, particularly in the social media, which Africans are misusing very badly, that somebody is quick to send Twitter, somebody is quick to send a message on Instagram or Facebook. You ask them, have you ever read the judgment? No, I have not read the judgment. Then what are you tweeting about? What are you Facebooking about? Alexander Pope. The English philosopher once said, a little modernity is a dangerous thing. Drink deep the western spring or taste not. Africans, one of the problems that we have, particularly the African intelligentsia, we have had given unto us a medium called the tweet. Nine out of ten Africans are misusing that medium. We were given a medium called Facebook. Nine out of ten times we are misusing the Facebook. We are given Instagram. Nine out of ten we are misusing Instagram. Africans must begin to be responsible. And before you send that send button in all these new media that we are using, read it again and ask yourself, whether 10 days from the day you sent the, you pressed the sent button, you will be happy with what you said. Unfortunately, in this part of the world, we are misused. Look at how it was used to good effect during the Arab Spring. But when we are murdering each other, we don't use it. Instead, we recede into our primordial instincts, into our ethnic cocoons and begin to speak in tongues that only destroy our people. But can Africans do the right thing? Yes, we have the capacity to do the right things. But we must interrogate and ask ourselves, where do we as a people want to go? A friend of mine from Cameroon <laughs> once again was saying after I listened to my memorial at Fela Kuti and I talked about Africa Agenda 2063, he said, that is too long. And I can't agree with him that even as we think about Agenda 2063, we must break it into compartments. And in his view, we must spend 10 years, and now even disagree with him, we must spend five years resolving the African disputes because as long as we have disputes and live wars, it will undermine our affairs. And that is why I said at the memorial that we must even consider calling all these rebel groups at a meeting and asking them, what do you want? What do you want? Tell us what you want. Are you rebels with a cause or rebels without a cause? Let us call Boko Haram. Let us call all these fringe bodies that are active in different countries, Al-Shabaab, and ask, him, ask them the fundamental primary question, what do you want? Tell us. Once we know what you want, then we can move in the next direction of resolving it for the be best interests of all the countries of Africa. These are hard choices, but history has demonstrated that that is the way to be done. As a high school student, I remember we used to hear about an urban guerrilla movement in the West Germany called the Red Brigades. They resolved the problem through negotiation. 
the Irish Republican Army in the United Kingdom through negotiation, the Basque Rebellion in Spain through negotiation, the Sandinistas, Sendero Luminoso in Latin America through negotiations. That is what we must do. We can no longer afford the luxury of saying that there are certain things that are not negotiable. My own view is that everything must be negotiated in order to preserve our nation. Otherwise, we'll be in a constant state of conflict and conflicts acquire life of their own until the combatants forget what it is that they are fighting about. They're just engaged in combat. One question people ask about strong advocates like yourself yes. is this, uh, why did you run for office to give life to your ideals? Um, why is <laughs> Professor uh, that, is, that is a question well, that I was asked. Of chaos. No, I, I ran in 2007 for a parliamentary seat and, and I, I said before I ran I was asked the same question. And I ran one of the most efficient campaigns in my view. I held within a constituency 250 meetings, town hall meetings, where I was interrogating the people. I gave nobody a single cent. My friends raised for me 3 million shillings. I spent 1.5, donated the balance to charity. But I told the people that the electorate does not respond to ideas. The person who won in the constituency where I was, never campaigned. But the night before, he was distributing money to everybody. What stimulates the African electorate is instant solutions. The 500 naira that he or she is going to use to buy gari or to buy maize meal in my country. That is the problem. African electorate on average does not respond to ideas. That is what we must do. The African electorate, once we have re-engineered our governance, must ask themselves, what do they want? And you've seen consistently in almost in every other country in Africa, those who acquired power through the ballot are not our best men and women. They are our most corrupt men and women, invariably. Even the leaders we now praise initially could never have been elected. Yoweri Kaguta Museveni in Uganda, when he contested in 1980s, failed. He came back through a guerrilla movement, succeeded. Now the Ugandan saw this man is good. Paul Kagame rescued the Rwandese. Now they think and know he's good. Mele Zenawi in Ethiopia, the African electorate must liberate themselves. Wole Soinka, who is in Nigeria, how many times has he tried to run for office? Did he not run for the presidency at one time here in Nigeria? Did the Nigerians elect him? The anti-corruption crusader Nuhuri Badu, did he not run for office? Did the Nigerians elect him? Jean Ping. In Gabon, he ran for election. Did they elect him? Africans don't elect men and women who wish them well. So, so Prof, how, how do we change this trajectory? I mean, how do we reorientate the electorates if they're going to liberate themselves, if they're not even willing to liberate themselves? What we are doing, the messages we are beginning to send, the beneficiaries will not be us. We who are the forerunners, we who are the harbingers, we who are putting our necks on the chopping board, we who appear to be speaking in the wilderness, we who appear to be orating in the void, we who appear to be irritating both official dom and the people, who we who appear to be to be too opinionated, we who appear to be pontificating, several years down the line it will be said of us holding all factors constant, they made sense. So it is not us who will be beneficiaries. It is another generation who will benefit. And they will benefit because we started this journey. Those who are now reaping the benefits of the activities of people like Martin Luther King Jr. 
are, are not uh, are different. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, not even enjoy what he fought for. Mahatma Gandhi and many others, Kwame Nkrumah and many others. So those who want to fight the war that they may take the spoils will be disappointed. I long liberated myself. In fact, I take the view that if you want to help Africans, don't expect anything from them. In that way, you are free. If I want public office or if I wanted to be appointed anything in the Kenyan government, I won't say the things that I keep saying because I, re I irritate people by speaking the truth. If I wanted to be appointed, I'll be sucking up to some president. I would be sucking up to somebody in, in, in officialdom that I may be appointed something. I'm not interested. I'm interested in saying the right things because I believe they're right. Am I always right? No, I'm not always right. Sometimes I make many mistakes, many fundamental mistakes, but when I is pointed out to me, I'm quick to apologize. Prof, uh, there are lots of questions uh, our, our viewers uh, will really love to ask, but I'm just going to take one from our Twitter handle. Um, what is your opinion on the Nigerian Senate rejection of Ibrahim Magu, the acting chairman of EFCC, as a substantive chair of the agency, having been a victim of parliamentary opposition yourself? You know, one of these things is, first of all, I do not know him very well, but I want to believe that he's a man of integrity. And if he's a man of integrity, I do not uh, have sufficient information to either support or, or, or to, 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 to castigate the decision that has been taken. But my only hope is that his rejection is based on clear reasons and that those reasons are reasons of integrity. But one of the things that happens in Africa is that if you are too clean and they cannot find somebody, something with which to hang you, they will not want you to get into public office. The typical African politician always desires to have somebody who has some skeleton in their closet. So that if you want to go too far in your investigation, they are able to say, please remember that there is a problem here which we can always fall back on. But if you are a man who is as clean as a whistle, then they are very uncomfortable with you. If you slip through their fingers, they'll find something else to remove you from office within a very short time. So you must be one of their own. As the saying goes, when you want to sup with the devils, you must use long spoons. Perhaps his spoon was not long enough. <laughs> Indeed. On a lighter note, uh, Prof, uh, we saw you putting on the British week recently during your appearance in Kenya yes. for Kenyatta. Recently, a British newspaper condemned those weeks as colonial relics. Yeah. You're an anti-colonial activist. Yes. Judging by your speeches, when, you're getting, when are you getting rig of your weeks? <laughs> The, the truth is, even the law that we administer is British. So there is a sense in which if we are going to overhaul the entire system, we've got to overhaul it. For the moment, let us not pretend. If the governments that we run, the states that we run, the, the states that we run in Africa are post-Westphalian states with the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, and the common law that we call common, essentially in former British colonies, are British laws, and for that reason, when you want to eat a pig, eat a fat one. If I'm going into a court that has a particular dress code, I dress according to that code. Let us not pretend. This idea that we are pretending that you... There is a story by Chinua Achebe in one of his books about a man called Dimarangana, who, according to his uh, religion, it was a taboo to use a knife to slaughter a dog, but he was prepared to use his teeth. <laughs> there is a sense in which I see a lot of pretense. My own view is that wigs are innocent, the suit is innocent. What is important is what is resident in our minds and hearts. You, you, if you begin condemning all these things, even the shoes is British, even the watches are foreign, all the things, even the microphone is foreign, even the television station is foreign. So my own view is, let us, and I'm happy you said it was on a light, 
touch. <laughs> <laughs> so, Prof, um, on the final note, um, what will be your advice for bringing breathing in hygiene into the African polity? You know, one of the things that uh, is very unfortunate in Africa is that we have no shortage of instruments. You remember Africa has the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, we even have a protocol on democratic governance in Africa, uh, both regionally in ECOWAS and in SADAC and in the East African community, and we have all these things. But I think that it must be a resolve by African peoples and African leaders that we are moving in a particular direction. And there must be leadership about it. This is why I was very happy, for example, when President Tabumbeki of South Africa came up with what was then referred to as African Renaissance. That is why I was very happy in 1984 when Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso started asking very nagging questions about how we govern ourselves. How do we re-engineer our governance? This is why I was very happy when President Museveni Mus in 1986-87 in these first 10 years in office was talking about, let us look at how we govern ourselves. And at that time, President Museveni said, do we need political parties? He posed the question. Is the thing called political party known to African governance system? And he came up with something called the movement system. Of course, Western government then told them that democracy equals to multi-party politics. How do we reintroduce or introduce hygiene in our politics? It's to interrogate governance systems in Africa. That to me is the next debate. The next debate is that African Union must engage in interrogating the so-called governance systems. Are they compatible with our ideals? In a continent where people think that one of their own must be the president, what systems can we have? Is it going to be easy? No, it is not going to be easy. So we must work at the leadership and also work at the electorate. Civic education. Sometimes we don't talk about it as we should, and people think that civic education are these periodic engagements that we have with the electorate and tell them that corruption is bad. They know corruption is bad. They know that electing people on the basis of their ethnicity or religion is a bad thing. What must we do to engage constructively at every level we use our institutions of governance, even traditional institutions, particularly here in West Africa, you have very strong institutions of traditional governance in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Sierra Leone and other places. How can we use all those in order to change people's minds? My ideas on how this is to be done are still in a state of formation, but I have no doubt in my mind that one of the things that we must do is to exercise the ghost of corruption, the ghost of negative ethnicity, the ghost of hatred, the ghost of selfless selfishness, the ghost of megalomania, the ghost of kleptomania, the ghost of stupidity, the ghost of ignorance, the ghost of condemnation without thought, the ghost of misusing Twitter and Instagram, the ghost of misusing Facebook, the ghost of being too opinionated, the ghost of castigating things simply because you don't like them, the ghost of wanting to be rich without work, the ghost of being judgmental without understanding. Once we have eliminated all those ghosts which are now resident in our hearts and minds, we can now embrace the spirit of Africanness, embrace the spirit of love, embrace the spirit of togetherness, embrace the spirit of political hygiene, embrace the spirit of economic prosperity, and embrace the spirit of self-esteem. And once we have this spirit resident in our minds and hearts, 
Africa will sit at the dinner table of human civilization as a respected diner, not as a waiter.